a bloody conflict of many years, have come to an end here in Dagbong. That means a lot to the people, especially women and children who have suffered for many years. Some of them know nothing about the war. The regions in the northern part of Ghana are about the poorest, but chieftains dispute, often bloody, have stagnated progress and promoted a cycle of poverty and rural urban migration. These conflicts have only inflicted losses, leaving in its way fatigue on the part of peace brokers and financial loss to the state running into millions of Ghana cities. Here in Dagbong, hundreds of people bear the physical and psychological scars of gruesome years of deadly disagreement. They also bear regrets as their calls for peace echo. In this documentary, I focus on the price the people have had to pay for the peace they enjoy today and which they want to sustain. People have paid the ultimate price development has been sacrificed and potentials buried. These are stories told from the perspective of Dagombas who share what they want to see in a new Dagmang. My name is Gifty and do appear. to Yendi, the capital of the Yendi municipality. It's a land full of baobab trees. The last time we checked in 2012, about 52,000 people lived here. And if you know the dynamics of any human settlement, you wouldn't be surprised if the figures have doubled in 2019. I'll show you around, tell you what the people have been telling me, and I'll show you what I have seen. It's a land screaming for investment, development and especially education for its youth. They indeed want peaceful coexistence after years of conflict. I'll tell you the story of two mothers, Sana and Shanka, who have lived through the conflict and are looking out for the future of their children now. You'll also get to know about monuments which some residents are entreating their leaders to focus on developing as tourist attractions. It is just another day in the lives of the Abdullahis here in Kundogu, a village in Yendi. Sana is the keeper of this home. She's also a shenat and maize farmer. For her children, Ilyasu and Hassana, Sana is an inspiration and she has big dreams for them. Ilyasu is eight years old and has no idea what the Dagbang conflict is all about. But like hundreds of other children, they are the most affected in times of war. Today, Ilyasu appears eager to join her colleagues at school. He wants to be a doctor, he says, to bring relief to what he describes as many sick people in his community. Because they are attending school and they are asked to pay any amount, I'm able to provide it. By God's grace, they will become responsible people in future, like doctors. But that's also a fragile expectation if peace does not prevail in Dagbang. Sana will leave for her farm soon, this time only in search for firewood from which she makes some money as the sheer nut season is over. Before she goes, her priorities are these little children. Preparing them for school is an art she seems to have mastered over the years. The final step is making them tea, which they sip from cups as big as their mother's heart for them and as colorful as they envisage their future. Bye-bye. They bid her goodbye and head to school. Life for Ilyasu and Hassana is simple. 
It means waking up with Abdullahi, their father, around, as silent as his presence may be, and to have Sana, their mother, shower her love and nurture their dreams. That's because they have not lived long enough to see what their parents have seen, the devastation of the conflict and the uncertainty it brings. Sana ponders over those years as she walks to her farm, even though it all happened a long time ago and the kingdom has worked tirelessly to move on now. The story is told about how two of three brothers occupied the Dagbaum skin on a rotational basis, a practice which dates back to the 18th century. These two families are the Abudus and Andanis. In 1974, a commission led by a judge, Niyama Oleno, under the Kutua Champon administration, diskinned the then Yana Muhammadu Abdullahi IV, a decision the Abudus would challenge in a long legal battle. Yana Yakubu Andani was then installed in 1974, but in March of 2002, he was killed in a war caused by disagreements over which of the gates should perform rituals for the celebration of the kingdom's festival, the Bugum, also known as the Fire Festival. That war would last for days, in which dozens were killed, leaving tensions almost tangible, and which affected all spheres of life in Dagbong for the years that would follow. Sana has just arrived on her two-acre farm. It looks dry, spent and empty. And here in Yendi, I have seen several lands like these. She tells me she has recently harvested some maize. But daily concerns like her farm business and taking care of her kids are not enough to make her forget the effects of the war. Among others, she worries about a perception, she says, is affecting all of the Gomba people. It is not proper because a lack of peace destroys the if there is no peace in Dabong, what can we do? But if there is consensus and unity, there will always be progress at all times. But without peace, we cannot progress. Sometimes when there are rumors of instability, it depresses you. And that alone is injurious to one's health. When there is peace, we can all go about our normal lives, prepare our children for school and take proper care of them. For the years that the conflict brewed, life was virtually at a standstill. And years after that, she only makes two bags of maize from a two-acre farm, with which she also feeds her tiny family. In ideal circumstances, this vast land should produce more, something in the region of 10 bags of maize. Sana believes investment in farmlands like her own holds the key to prosperity in Yendi. But... With the years of conflict came along investor apprehension, hampering the potential of a booming local economy based on farming in Yendi, which also has effects for food security nationwide. Our major challenge is lack of financial support for our Greek activities. There are quite a number of my colleagues who would have loved to venture into farming, but they are unable to do so because of lack of funding. In recent times, most people are cultivating soya beans and maize because there is a demand for these cereals. But because of lack of funding, some are unable to do so. The effects to the farming business is not even the worst of it. Several lives have been lost. In times of war, people are compelled to either stay and fight or flee as fast and far as possible. Sana has a vivid recollection. 
Sometimes, just immediately you harvest your produce from the farm after all the toil, there is trouble and you have to run for your life. During the Dagumba Kokumba conflict, there was serious destruction of property. And even at that time, some of us had no children, so we could afford to run for our dear lives. But now we have children. How do you carry all your children when you are running? And that is why we need lasting peace in Yendi and Dagbom. Government responsibility to people in such situations is shifted drastically from developmental projects to security. It is compelled to invest in protecting the people from themselves rather than investing in health, education, youth employment and anything else to improve the standards of living. Sana tells me dropping out of school has become about the easiest thing to do for young people here. She hopes that will change now that the kingdom is gradually moving forward. There are some years that we get poor harvest and then your child passes his or her exam and is supposed to proceed to the next level of his education. You rush into your room and there's nothing to pick out to sell in order to pay the school fees in the regions of 1,000 to 3,000 cities. Our inability to pay ends up making our wards drop out of school. And when they drop out, it means they can no longer become the doctors and teachers they aspire to be. Today, we have followed Sana's children to school, more than half an hour after they left home and while she was still on the farm. We found them in the middle of the road and then later loitering after they finally arrived at school. Not that these children do not want to go to school. Their attitudes towards attendance and those of teachers here have been largely shaped by the conflict, the fear and tension it left behind and the poverty it bred for their parents over the years. When they go to break, they don't want to come back because sometimes the parents, it seems they are living, the condition is not better for them. So sometimes the feeding is a problem for them. And some of them to, to buy the books or uniforms for them. So some of them, they are not in their uniform because of the poor condition of the parents. So if we get assistance, from the any agencies, I believe that it will improve the people to come in the school. But without peace, even the teachers cannot come to school, and without the peace, the students too cannot come to school. Yakubu is assistant head teacher here at the only school in Gundogu. He himself has witnessed the war and is part of those helping to bring to fruition the dreams of children like Sana's own Eliasu and Hasana. The children, they are improving because we are advising them to be to take serious in their learning the children scramble for a seat in the classroom but this was only for a glimpse of our camera because they dispersed in like manner soon after we finished filming there were no teachers in any of the classrooms when we arrived but for Sana Taking her children through this school is the only option to escape a cycle of poverty brought about by conflict. Like the mothers here in Dagbang, her biggest expectations are in the education of Eliasu and Hassana. But again, if the peace found now is not sustained, teachers cannot help but desert the school and Eliasu's dreams of becoming a doctor will painfully fade away. Unlike her son, Eliasu, who wants to be a doctor, Sana's six-year-old daughter, Hasana, wants to sell cooked rice in the future. <laughs> For Sana too, I'm grateful to God. If in future she becomes a nurse or teacher, I will still be grateful to God. Sana's thoughts for her daughter are far from cooking and selling rice, 
so she hopes that Hassana's choice will change as she is exposed to education. As she returns from the farm, she contemplates and actually hates thoughts of the possibility that the dreams of her children could be shattered because of a conflict they know absolutely nothing about. Her confidence about her children's future is built on the hope that the peace deal sealed in Dagon now will be sustained. I cultivate maize, millet and kalpi. She can barely remember the ages of her children, but what is certain and which she shares with Sana is that she wants a better future for her children in a better developed and peaceful Dagbaum. If one of my children becomes a teacher, the other a doctor, and another becomes a farmer, I will be very happy. Farming is also a profession. If the farmer cannot get money to buy his or her needs, they can still depend on the farm produce for survival. Here on Shanka's three-acre farm, she is harvesting millet. The maize she grows is for domestic use only, she says. It is meant for a family, including extended relations, whilst the cowpea, granite and millet are what she sells to clear out all financial burdens, including school fees. She gives me these details as proof of the many lives dependent on her farming business. The survival of this business and those who depend on her are all attached to a peaceful yendi. I am unable to meet my own basic needs. How then do I get involved? In no, 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 no. Disagreement of the past and the conflict should indeed not be part of her daily concerns. But Shanka is also not oblivious of the untold hardships that the days of conflict bring and the stalemate it perpetuates. She envisages the cycle of poverty is about to be broken with a new peace deal. <laughs> Its disadvantages are dire. If conflicts start during the farming season, we are unable to go to the farm and cannot feed our children as a result of that. So conflict exposes us to poverty and hunger. But again, hunger, poverty, lack of investment and the developmental stalemate in education are not about the worst effects of the conflicts they have known yet the lives lost is. It is unclear the exact number of people who have been killed because of the Dagbang conflict, but the facts remain that in 2002 alone, over 40 elders died alongside the Yana at the time. Several others were injured, and the people now live with the aftermath of the war, some physical, others emotional and psychological but they are bent on moving forward. I was seriously sick and was sent to the village for treatment. People left town to Accra to work as headquarters. But truly speaking, none of my biological children have ever gone for Kayae. It was only my brother's son, called Gurundo, who went to Accra because of the lack of peace. He died there, and his funeral was performed here in the village. His only son also died later. There are many men and women like Shanka's son who have migrated to Accra. Most of them live and work in Nagbogloshi and the central business district, where the conditions are harsh and life is tough. 
based on the customs and traditions of Dabon. After over 17 years of back and forth, a committee of eminent chiefs led by Santehini Otunfo Osei II presented a peace roadmap to the presidency in December 2018. This committee took a decision and said that the funeral of Nam Muhammad Abdullah should be performed from the 14th of December to the 28th of December this year. So they have a one week respite and the next will be from the 4th to the night, another two, four, 4th to the 19th or 18th of January. Then the Andanians would also perform. So we hopefully believe so that after the 18th, the oracles will start and God willing, within the few days, we shall have a new Yana. We've come to this conclusion based on the customs and traditions of Dabon. This roadmap has not come on a silver platter. There were times that the Abudus accused the committee and me of not wanting to, to listen to them. There was a time the Andanis also accused the, me of not listening to them. But I no. told them I'm a father to all of them and I need to be fair. But it presented the leaders of Dagbong an opportunity to start afresh. And in a historical spectacle, a funeral which had waited since 1988 was finally performed, led by the Bolin Lana with Dagon culture on display for the Abudu family. That would be followed by the funeral of the Andani family with the Kampakuyana leading the gate in similar fashion. Musketry, wives of the then Yana who have waited 17 years in chastity and the circumambulation were all on display. Subsequently and almost immediately after the final day of the funeral, a new Yana was announced. We have selected the Saruguna as our new Yana. And so when that touch, the piece of grass was given to me, I added some cola and then sent it to Yona, signifying that he is a new Yana elected. With that announcement came a great deal of anticipation, but also a curfew, one which the Gombas envisage will be the last. Shanka speaks of the need for investment in this farm and craves for a dagbon in which the hard work she does here on the farm will contribute meaningfully to the local economy and create jobs. My main challenge during the farming season is to get a tractor to plow the land for me. But the tractor owners do it on credit. So by the end of the season, if I harvest two or three bags of millet, I can only make profit about 50, 60 or 100 cities the whole year. Yes, the profit I make is 60 cities. And this year, I had a very poor harvest. The walk home from Shanka's farm is a long 20-minute journey. She does this every day, all for the future of her children and in anticipation that never again Will the misunderstanding between two families and essentially two brothers affect her ability to take this long walk in peace? I have an appeal for people who are interested in supporting our farming business. We need investors for our farms as well as other interventions to support the fertility of our land. Our main prayer is that we will have a peaceful double to boost our local economy and fight poverty. As I leave her home, Shanka is preparing dinner for her household where it is quiet and serene and the only sound flows faintly from a mobile phone. It is a contemporary Bagbani music.
They want this stillness to remain in Dagbang as they anticipate a lot of government's intervention to boost the economy. I want to be empowered so that I can keep cultivating my farm. I am grateful to you and pray that God blesses you and promote you and grant us unity in Dagbon. It's not good for us to have disagreement. Dagombas and Kokombas are the same people. My mom is Kokomba and my first daughter is married to a Kokomba man and they have seven children. I sometimes call for support when things get difficult. While Shanka prays on, I return to the home of Sana in Gundogu. With nightfall comes more of her motherly duties to her children, Ilyasu and Hassana. As she prepares dinner, her anticipation and expectation of the new Yana are not different from that of Shanka, just as they share in similar aspirations for their children. Most importantly, these two women are not alone. So before the entire village goes to sleep, Sana and her compatriot revive an old practice of coming together to sing for peace. Just as the fire is being quenched here, the women here want the war drums to stop, the conflict to end immediately. It's been many years of conflict and of course a lot has been lost. But many times in conflict, women and children are the most vulnerable 